Well then, with a view to God's blessing, let's turn again to Psalm 90, which we read, and which is entitled, A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. Psalm 90, and especially the last few words of the psalm. The last petition he makes, the last request he offers to God. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. <clears throat> now this was originally offered as a prayer. It is designed for singing. And it was brought into the book of Psalms for singing by the church. It is probably because it's written by Moses, the oldest psalm in the book of Psalms. And as I mentioned before we read it, the particular reason I want to look at it with you is just this. That it is intimately connected with the conquest of the promised land under Joshua. Now that's what we're looking at on Sunday nights, and it's an important thing to look at. Because the way in which Israel go into the land of Canaan, to establish that land as a God-fearing land, and to make it a kind of bridgehead from which they can go into the world with the gospel, that is a lot to say to ourselves as a church too. We always have a calling to conquer the land that is around us for Christ and to bring the knowledge of the gospel to others. So there is obviously something to be learned from the way in which Israel go about their task. Something to say to you and to me about how to conquer a land by the grace of God, how to conquer it for God, how to bring the gospel to those who need to hear it. Now we've seen in the last few weeks that we can't just begin with the book of Joshua itself. The fact of the matter is that Israel didn't conquer right away, they failed to conquer at the beginning. When the time was right to go into the promised land, they didn't. And they couldn't because of their unbelief. And we saw the catastrophic failure, not just on the part of the spies who went in and who brought back an unbelieving report, but on the multitude of the people who chose to believe that unbelieving report rather than the message of faith that Caleb and Joshua had. The result is that their unbelief destined them to 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Now that 40 years was itself designed to teach them, so that when the period was finished, they would be able to come back and to conquer the land in faith. So obviously the lesson being taught in that 40 year period, taken as a whole, was the importance of trusting in God, having faith to surmount obstacles, the kind of faith that keeps the commandments of God and through a belief in his power does exploits. And by the time the 40 years were finished, Israel was ready to do that. She had learned from her unbelief and learned from God's chastisement of it. Now I don't know in what precise situation you may be spiritually today. You may be more or less beginning as a Christian in the first flush of your spiritual youth, good and well. It is a good time to go out for you and to conquer the land. Or it may be that for a time you as a Christian have been ravaged and blighted by unbelief. The question for you is whether you have learned from that. Are you in a fit state to conquer a land? Are you in a fit state to do something for God, or do you have to spend some more time under his chastisement before you yourself are able to do that thing for God? A good question. 
It involves self-examination, spiritual self-assessment under the word of God. Where am I? And am I ready? Have I learned? Have I grown from my past? Have I put it to good use? And am I able in faith now to do what you are calling me to do? Good questions. Good questions for us all. Now then, that takes us to the psalm. It takes us to Moses. And it takes us to how he feels about the wilderness experience. And it takes us to what he wants for the church in the wilderness experience too. If you want to date this psalm, you can date it very simply to the wilderness. And you can date it in this way. It is simply Moses' response to God's chastisement. It's Moses' response to the wilderness wandering. What it says to him, what it says to the people, and what he wants it to do by the grace of God for all of them as they become ready to take the land again. Now when you look at the psalm, you can essentially divide it up fairly easily in two. The first part is what you would call a meditation. He thinks about God and he thinks about themselves deeply and spiritually. And then on the basis of that thoughtful reflection, he begins to pour out petitions. Come back to us. Teach us. Let your beauty be on us. Establish our works. Six great petitions at the close of the psalm, but they all rise out of his deep spiritual meditation upon God and himself and the people. Now let me just say to you in the passing that that's the way prayer works best. It's very easy to come babbling before God with our vain repetitions and our endless series of poorly thought out requests. Not getting at anybody here. Just myself, sometimes. The best prayer is one that is thought about. The best, best prayer rises out of a meditation. It is an intelligent prayer and a spiritual one. And the Psalms are full of that. Take, for example, Psalm 19, where David speaks of the glory of God's word. And he uses several different words to express the glory and the grandeur and the majesty of the word of God. Just as the sun scorches his way across the heavens, illuminating it all, so he says the word of God does. It scorches its way across the universe of your own heart and illuminates it. And when he has thought about the glory of God and his word, and when he has thought about the darkness and the depravity of his own heart, he begins to ask God for things. He prays that God would search him out. That God would cleanse him from sin. That God would keep him from perverseness and stubbornness and wickedness. And he says, accept the meditation of my heart. Let my thoughts and my words be acceptable in your sight. Notice he doesn't just pour out a series of requests. They arise out of a conscious meditation upon God in relationship with himself. Let our prayers be like that. Let there be less requests and more meditation so that the requests will be real, felt, deep and spiritual and meaningful in the ears of God. So he meditates here on himself, God and on the people and on the basis of that he makes his requests. Now, it's interesting that the very first verse begins simply by ascribing to God the glory of being his dwelling place. And that verse really stands alone. You have been our dwelling place in all generations. That's written by a man who's been living in a tent now for years. At the head of men who have been living in tents now 
for years. They didn't think they would. They thought they would be in an established place very quickly. But no, they're in tents for years. But he can say nonetheless, though his dwelling has been in the wilderness, his dwelling has been in God. You have provided the refuge and the shelter of your wings. And that, he says, has been true really in all generations. We're more conscious of it in the wilderness, but it is always true that the real people of God only have a refuge in God himself. This is a waste howling wilderness. This has got no home for you at all. Before you were a Christian, this was home. But now as a Christian, it's not home at all. You're a stranger. There's a perpetual sense of restlessness in you. And the only dwelling and refuge you find is under the wings of God. Psalm 91 goes on to say that. That the one who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You are my dwelling place and the dwelling place of all your people. So he declares that. I am satisfied, O Lord, with you. And then he goes on to think of the greatness of God in comparison with the frailty of man. You can't miss that in the psalm. God is infinite. He is from everlasting to everlasting. Man goes back to destruction. God endures, majestic on high. Man disappears. He comes awake in the morning and he dies at night. He's gone. The glory of God and the frailty of man. And of course, when he turns to man, well, it's verse 2 that brings the greatness of God before us. Before the mountains were brought forth, so you formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. You have always been, he says. You have always been. You are. You are. Eternal. Yahweh. I am that I am. I change not. From everlasting to everlasting, you are the same unchanging God. And then, man. Man. Moses can well speak of man. He's lived 120 years himself, pretty near 120 when this psalm itself is written. He's had a lifetime to think about himself, to come to know himself. And he's had a lifetime to think about the people around him too. And what's he impressed with? Well, it seems that what he's primarily impressed with in the psalm here is our frailty, our mortality. He's a dying man himself, and he's in the midst of dying people. And the reason he brings that out is because he wants the church to remember that. We'll come to it in a moment. Teach us to number our days, he says. He wants to remember it himself, that he's a dying man. And he wants everybody to remember that they are dying men too. Because we need somehow to live our lives in the light of that. You'll never live unless you understand that you're dying. Why you're dying and how imminent your death actually is. Once you grasp that, you might just begin to live. And Moses wants himself to know it. Teach us to number our days and let the people know it too. And you'll notice how vividly he describes that mortality. It's so relentless, he says in verse 5, you carry them, and that is humanity, one generation after another, you carry them away like a flood. Just like a flood, you see it sometimes on television, just sweeping everything before it in its path. That, he says, is like death. Just down through the generations it sweeps and it cuts swathes of humanity down before it, remorseless, relentless. And, he says, this death is so imminent. It catches us all and it comes so quickly. Life is hardly begun when it's finished. He says in verse 6, 
that we are like the grass that flourishes and grows in the morning. In the evening it is cut down and it withers. In verse 5, it describes the whole of humanity as being like a sleep. What is a sleep? Well, a sleep is something that you fall into and you wake up and you wonder where it went. That, he says, is life. It's scarce begun when it's finished. Now, I know if you're here probably and you're 12 or 13 or 15 and 16, you don't maybe think like that. That's true. You think you've got lots of years ahead. Well, fair enough. That's just the way it is. That's the way we think. But that's not the reality. Most of you here today know what this means. Most of you have begun to taste how brief life actually is. Let the effect of that come before us a little later on. But what he also wants us to notice is this. It isn't just that death cuts us all down like a flood, that it comes imminently to us all, but that it's God who actually appoints it. God does it. God takes our life away. Verse 3, you turn man to destruction. And you say, return, O children of men. Return. Now, this word is sometimes understood as being repent. Come back to me. Now, of course, that's what the word return sometimes does mean in the scripture. Return to me and come to know me as the source of life and so on. And that's all very true and very important. But when Moses says this here, he's not talking about the need to repent. What he's talking about is God summoning each man and woman back to the dust of the earth. When God created us first, we were never meant to dissolve. We were never meant for dissolution. Never meant to return to the ground. But when our thousand years are up, as was the case with Methuselah, the longest lifespan recorded, or whether it is 70 years or 80 years, God says, no, come back. Was that not part of the curse pronounced upon humanity? Dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. And when it's 70, 80, or a thousand, nearly in the case of Methuselah, God says, time up. Come back to the dust from whence you came. It's a solemn call from heaven that causes our death. It's not the process of atoms and change. It's not the disintegration of a natural evolutionary world. It is God who says, time up. And God who says, come back, return to the dust from whence you came. And the solemn part of that, as Ecclesiastes tells us, is this. That when the body returns to the ground from whence it came, the spirit returns to the God who gave it. Oh yes, if it was simply a case of dissolution and return to the earth, that's one thing. But solemnly, the spirit returns to the God who gave it. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether they are good or whether they are evil. And why do we die? Well, verse 7 tells us that we are consumed by God's anger. By his wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, and our secret sins in the light of your countenance, for all our days have passed away in your wrath. The end of our life has something to do with the anger of God. Now I could say a lot about that, and it's an interesting thought, but I want you here to notice something very important. And that's that this psalm must be rooted in a precise historical occurrence. When we think of God's wrath being somehow involved in the end of all our lives, there is a special sense in which it's involved in the end of all the lives of the children of Israel here. What sense? Well, remember from a few weeks ago that God had passed a judgment on them. He didn't just say, for your unbelief, go back to the wilderness and learn. 
But God said that you won't come out of it until every one of you has died over the age of 20. So that it's a new generation that comes in to inherit this land of promise. Every single one of you over the age of 20 shall die. Now this is a group of people numbering over 2 million souls. Do the maths, as they say. Do the maths. In 40 years, every one of them over 20, which is the bulk of them, will die in the wilderness. And you can well imagine, you see, as a person dies here and there, the conversation, well, didn't that one die young? Didn't that one die young? How are so many dying young? Do they need to remember why? Every single death, every single funeral that took place in the camp was a reminder to them of their own past unbelief and the need to believe God. It was a loud sermon. They say that a funeral preaches. Well, so it does and so it should. When anyone dies, that should be a sermon. I hope it is to you and to me, although you partly sometimes become oblivious to it. Although God forbid that you should. But these funerals were all sermons. All dying young because they did not believe in the word of God. Now, let me just stop and say this. If that doesn't tell you and me that God hates unbelief, I don't know what does. If anything was ground into the life of the church in the wilderness, it's that God hates unbelief. He hates unbelief, I would say, more than anything. Israel were to learn that the fear of man that kept them out of the promised land, the weakness that made them refuse to step out with the message with which they were entrusted, the brooding discouragement that took place, that took the place of the optimistic faith that they should have, God hates it. And every carcass in the wilderness was a reminder that God hates it. Now let's take that right to ourselves. If you're unconverted here today, let me say to you very starkly that what God hates primarily in your life is your unbelief. Please understand that. You may be conscious of a sin or a set of sins in your life. Some of them have you in their grip all right. And I don't know what it is. Maybe hatred, cynicism, bitterness, malice, wrath, envyings, lying, cheating, embezzling, there's a million of them out there. But I'll tell you right now, the one that God hates the most is your unbelief. The fact is this, that if you can deal with that one, you can deal with the rest. If you don't deal with that one, you'll never deal with the rest. You can try and patch up, you can try and reform, you can try and change course, you can dress yourself up. You can try and sober yourself, you can try and walk on a straight and narrow, you can try and tell the truth, you can do what you like. But you can't dress yourself up before God, and nothing, nothing, nothing will avail you except to turn in your emptiness and begin believing God. Accept the truth of his assessment of you, the truth of who he is, he says he is himself, in the Lord Jesus Christ, embrace that and God will sort your life out. That is the very essence of change and repentance. It is turning round in your poverty and your need and in your emptiness, casting yourself upon God and saying, Lord, accept me, receive me for Christ's sake and deal with me and sort me out. That's where it begins. You can't dress yourself up for God. You must come honestly and humbly to God to dress yourself up. Do we see the vital difference between these two? 
Unbelief is what God hates primarily. Will you not deal with that? Your sins are bothering you. Does this one bother you? Your failure to accept the gospel, to accept Christ, let this please be the sin that bothers you. Sort that one, and you're on the way to sorting the rest. You too, you are a Christian. Let me tell you that he hates this more than anything else. I sometimes think that if only I could believe God, if only we could believe him unquestioningly, uncritically, wholeheartedly, accept his word, act on it, embrace his promises, do exploits, how different our lives would be. We don't honestly realize that most of our sins are the fruit of simple unbelief. That our failures are not so much the results of our sins per se, but our failure to believe God. Deal with that one, and we'll deal with the rest ourselves too. So that is the lesson being taught to the church, that God hates unbelief. Now for a moment, suppose you're Moses, and you're thinking about all these things, and you're presiding over how many funerals. You're presiding over the deaths of men younger than yourself. You're conscious of a church being decimated. How would you feel? How would you feel? You can look at this as something of a tragedy, I suppose. In a sense, if you want to. It would be wrong to, but you could look at it like that. Here's a man who grew up as a boy in Egypt, conscious of his own destiny. And although he neglects it for years, at 40 years of age, God calls him powerfully to fulfill that destiny. He kills an Egyptian, and he calls Israel to follow him, and they do not. He's effectively sent to Coventry, and he is banished for 40 years. And as a man of 80, God tells him, right, go back and do what you started to do 40 years ago. And he's mighty reluctant to do it. But God gets him into the frame of obedience. And he's sent back into Egypt, and he sees the mighty works of God. He sees the plagues on unbelief. He sees the Passover. He sees the glory of Christ. Like Abraham, his forefather, he sees the day of Christ and he rejoices in it. And with great gladness, he leads two million police, people plus out of Egypt. He sees a Red Sea split by the power of God. And he goes into a wilderness. And just on the threshold of the land of promise, the whole thing falls apart. And he turns round and goes back into a wilderness. An old, old man, let's say at this point about a hundred years old. And all he sees around him is death and decay. And to compound it all, because he lost his temper as God's leader, God said, you're not even going to see it yourself. You can climb up the mountain top and you'll see the land of promise but you won't set foot in it yourself. You could understand if this meditation would be a gloomy one. You could understand it if he said, Why, Lord, and what does it all mean? But that is not what the psalm actually says at all. And however dark the meditation may seem on first reading, and even if the prayers at the end seem to be a kind of longing and a hope for something that he's not quite going to get, that's wrong. This is a mighty optimistic psalm. This is a psalm that's full of hope and full of encouragement. Because Moses knows that as these years are passing in the wilderness, something has happened. Something is going away and something is coming back in its place. An unbelieving generation is passing away. 
A generation, yes, that may have looked to God all right, but a generation that didn't make full use of its opportunities. And Moses knows that a new generation is growing up under the hand of God, which is different. A generation that is hopeful and optimistic and willing to dare and willing to do exploits. Moses knows that. And he knows that after he has disappeared, Joshua will come into his place and that they will do the work that God called them to do 40 years ago. Now that's all to ourselves. It's all to ourselves personally. Maybe God expected more of you 40 years ago. And it's just now that you're going to put that right. There's nothing I hate more myself than a sense of missed opportunities. I don't like it. I don't like the thought of being on a deathbed saying, well, I wish I had done this or that. And I want you to resolve by the grace of God not to lie in your deathbed saying, I wish I did this or that. And I mean that especially for you today if you're a non-Christian. For any favor, never lie on your deathbed saying, well, I wish I had done this or that. I wish I had repented. I wish I had believed. I wish I had lived my life for God like my mother taught me to do. Like my father prayed for me to do, I wish I had lived my life for God. But neither say as a Christian too, I wish I had done more. I wish I had stepped out a bit more. I wish I had conquered a land instead of sulked around in a wilderness. And Moses knows that a new generation is arising that's full of hope and expectation and will take the promised land. And it's on that basis that he now starts to pour out his petitions. Where do they begin? Verse 12. And he takes them out one after the other, not as a kind of list, but as something that's arisen out of the depths of his heart. The first one is a wonderful petition. Verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Two parts to that. Teach us first to number our days. Now, who knows that? Eh? Who knows how long his days are in life? What does he mean by saying, number them? Well, all he means by that is just simply help me to realize that they are numbered. They are finite. Probably 70, or if by reason of strength, you might get 80. Oh, you might get 90. But what is that, he says, but just labor and sorrow? To add a few extra years is to add, in all probability, some extra years of weakness, of sickness, and of frailty. Ninety plus is not going to be the prime of your life. No disrespect to anyone here who's ninety plus. Just a fact. You'll know it better than I do if you're ninety plus. It's not going to be the prime of your life. Teach us to number our days, to realize that they are short. Why? So that you will live life accordingly. Notice how he puts it. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now, he doesn't just mean by that, help us to know how short life is so that we'll be wise about life. Yes. But he means especially this. He means that we have a short time to learn wisdom and a short time to apply it. We've begun a study of God's truth in the Westminster Confession of Faith. It's good to know that when you're young. It's good to know God's truth and God's wisdom when you're young. Doesn't the book of Proverbs tell you that? It's good to treasure it up in your heart. It's never too late to start, by the way, but it's good to treasure it up in your youth. To know God's wisdom and to live by it. Why? Because your days are short. And you know, you should have the attitude to spiritual things of a people who feel, man, this life is so short, I had better start using it right now. Suppose God has another ten years for you. Use them. Learn. Know. Grow. And live life accordingly. The Apostle Paul told us to redeem the time. Yes, it's as though time is in the possession of somebody else. And you need to buy it back. You need to use it. The hours that God gives you on God's good earth, how many of them are wasted? How many of them could be used in deepening our knowledge of himself? 
in serving his people, and we fritter them away. Too much time on television, too much time on magazines, too much time daydreaming, too much time listening to songs. Before you know it, four hours wasted. Let recreation have its own place. Don't let it dominate your life. Let the word of God dominate your life. We'll see that in Joshua tonight. God willing. We'll see how God's word dominated in Joshua's life. Let it dominate yours. Let me think how short a time I shall on earth remain that I may give my heart to God's wisdom and live by it that we may live thereby. And in verse 13, he prays this too. Return, O Lord. How long? And have compassion on your servants. Come back to us, O God, in power. That's written by a man who saw so much power and who felt that the church wasted the opportunity. You may have lived in better and brighter days too. You may have tasted perhaps even the afterglow of our revival. You saw men and women of faith. And that should have been a springboard for yourself to rise higher than they ever were. But no, you didn't. And because of that, we've had leanness, leanness, leanness. And Moses says, come back, Lord. Come back. We have learned now that it is a bitter thing to disbelieve. We have learned how excruciatingly frustrating spiritual failure is. Now, as a repentant people, come back and help us to do what we could have done before. Do you believe that God can do that? Ha <laughs> that's the question. Do you believe that? Do you believe that turning to him today as a people will mean that he will turn back to you and shower you with these blessings with which he was ready to bless you 30 years ago. And you say, ah, oh, no. No! Do you want more wilderness? Or do you want some of the promised land? Surely you want the promised land. Lord, we have learned. Please come back. And he says, gladden our hearts. Verse 14, satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Gladden our hearts. Moses is conscious that with a heavy period of chastisement, well, the people, even when they are awakening, they still have that sense that God's hand is upon us. But Moses now says, just as we have seen tough years, he says, will you please give us glad and good ones? In proportion, in proportion, make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us. It's as though Moses is saying, you took us down here to teach us. Now he says, lift us up there. And just as you brought us so low to teach us these hard lessons, now lift us up so high. Make us glad according to our pain. And glad all our days. Notice that. That we may rejoice, he says at the end of verse 14, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Why does he anticipate being glad all our days? Because he anticipates that they've really learned a lesson. No, that's why... In Deuteronomy, when Moses is just about to die, the last exhortation he gives to the people of Israel, he says, get into the land, he says. Stay away from the idols. Don't contaminate yourself with them. Make sure you keep my commandments. Make sure you keep my worship pure and holy. And make sure you teach my statutes to the children that you're raising up. In other words, learn a lesson from the disaster of the past. And do this in the future, and you'll be glad all your days. Yes, you'll have your sins of infirmity. You'll have your weaknesses. You'll have your blemishes and your failings. And you'll confess them before God. But if you do that, you'll avoid the backslidings. 
You'll avoid the major disasters. You'll avoid the shocking unbelief that banishes you to wilderness years. You see, they need not be. There's a vast difference between the sins of infirmity that are ours and will cleave to us the rest of our days. A vast difference between that on the one hand and the cataclysmic failure to obey God in singular important things which destines you to a wilderness experience. Do we understand that? If we can learn to keep God's commandments and pass them on by God's grace, we shall be glad all our days and rejoice in them. What a promise that is. Is it not? Is it not a marvelous promise that we shall be glad all our days? And then he says this, verses 16 and 17, he says, Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. Let your work appear to your servants. I think that is a reference. I'm not sure about this, but I think the reference there is just this. Let your dealings with us, the, even the work of chastisement, let that bear fruit in the lives of your servants. Hebrews 12 tells us that when God deals with us as with sons, he chastises us sometimes. And I think we all have to say we're somehow under that. God is showing us all his displeasure. The question is, who learns from it? The question is, who responds to it? Daniel even felt that he himself had sinned with the people. But who responds and how do you respond? Do you respond in obedience, in repentance, or wringing of your hands? The response here well, let your work appear to your servants in such a way that it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness in our lives. Let's now see you working again. Let's see you splitting red seas. Let's see you slaying the giants. Let's see you bringing forth such praise and glory in our lives because for too long we were stunted. And let your glory appear to our children. Isn't there, isn't there a link there? Let us see your work and let our children see your glory. <clears throat> Some children, of course, grew up seeing early deaths in the wilderness and they were taught why. You know, we must teach our children the reasons for failure. We must do that. We must even learn our history and know why did we fail, why did we fall, and teach our children differently. And Moses wants to see a generation rise that's greater than the one that passed away. Do you? Our children are being taught in Sunday school. I hope they're being taught in your house. I hope they're taught in mine. Is your prayer that the glory of God would be upon them? Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Some people don't care about the generation to come. It should be your primary concern as a Christian. That's what baptism is all about. That's what covenant is all about. Our children, let your glory be upon our children. And then this last request... Now, this doesn't mean I'm just coming to the text. I hope you understand that the text is just a summary of the whole psalm. But notice how he finishes. Oh, he says, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. You know, there's a sense in which a man like Moses may feel, What did I do? What did I do? And it's easy for all God's people to think that. What did I achieve? What did I do? He never dreamt, really, that he would die himself in the wilderness, not seeing anything come to pass. 
But he has faith to believe that God is doing something through his teaching and through his labor. As a parent, you sometimes feel looking at your children, what have I done? What have I accomplished? As an elder or a minister, you can say, what what have I accomplished? What have I achieved? Well, he wants God to establish the work that he has done. As much as to say, I feel it's nothing, but you can make it something. And especially in the children we teach, you can make it something in them. Make it fruitful, please. Now, when a petition like that is wrung from the heart of a man or woman of God, that man or woman will see that fruit one day. Calvin said that the Lord's people bear more fruit than they know. And you can be sure that the people who earnestly pray this, not from a list, but a wrung out of their heart through spiritual experience, are a people who see the most fruit. One day, one day, you've no idea where the seed went and the fruit that it will bear. But let that be your prayer and let it be mine. I mean, this is a beginning for us, in a sense, as a congregation, is it not? It's the start of something, but none of us can pretend we don't have a past. We all do. But let's have the prayer, as we put our hand to this, that God would establish the work of our hands. Establish it. Make it meaningful and make it real. And with that, Moses gets ready to hand the torch to Joshua, knowing that he's the man who shall take them into the promised land. Did Moses die a sad man? No. Died a happy man. God buried him, we're told, on Mount Nebo. Wasn't a man who felt it had been a waste of time at all. He knows that God takes the long view, and we must take the long view too. Let's get at it. See if we've learned something. And let's banish unbelief out of the heart. And who knows what we can conquer then by the grace of God. Let us pray. <clears throat> O oh Lord, how great an enemy is unbelief, how much it hinders us from accomplishing. Did I not say that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Those were your words to Martha in the days of your enfleshment in humility. And surely it is a message to to ourselves, that if we will but believe, we too shall see the glory of God. And if unbelief has blighted our lives for a year or five or ten, by your grace let us learn from that and establish the work of our hands. Yes, O Lord, establish the work of our hands. In Christ's name, Amen.